Welcome to College Admissions Toolbox, giving you the edge you need to get into the colleges of your dreams with your host, Steve Schwartz. That's me. Today, we're talking with Judy Rothman. Judy, welcome to College Admissions Toolbox. I'm so excited to have you on the program here. You've got incredible background. You're an Emmy Award winning children's television writer. You've got a popular blog and now a best selling book called Neurotic Parents Guide to College Admissions. Tell us a little bit about your journey and a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you are today. Okay, well, it was a very circuitous route. Um, I'm not really a college admissions specialist, or I guess I am now, but I didn't sign up for that. Um, I originally studied linguistics. I taught English as a second language. I taught in three Latin American um, countries, and I ended up back in New York where I worked at Sesame Street, then moved to L.A., worked at Disney, and left Disney with a development deal and became... Um, an animation writer. And then in the meantime, I was raising two kids and I started doing more television development than actually writing because I didn't want to sit around the table late at night. And when my older son was ready to go on his college tour, I mentioned to some of the soccer moms that we were going to eight states and 14 colleges in 10 days. And they all said, well, didn't you read all the books? You're not supposed to do that. You know, you should really blog about it. So I started a blog, which I thought was really going to be more about logistics because my son was more interested in watching all the March Madness games than actually seeing colleges. <laughs> but but um, the blog ended up going viral on the third or fourth day when we were at NYU, and I transcribed verbatim what I called the most obnoxious question asked by a parent at an information session. You want me to read that? Absolutely. I'd love to hear it. Okay. It was parents. I know you mentioned you had a four-year language requirement, but my son has taken every language AP and almost every other AP offered by his school. So what if he had an opportunity like, okay, I'll tell you what the opportunity is to be the head anchor on a local news show and the entire program revolves around him. Would that be okay rather than the required four years of a language? And could we list that as a special award? And the NYU Dean of Admissions, cutting her off, said, sure, that would be fine. And that, that was when I realized <laughs> that parents were just um, crazy, especially on the East Coast compared to the West Coast. And I was um, at that that night, I looked, I, my son actually figured out how to look at the statistics on my blog. And I had 500 hits, I had, although I'd only told four people about it. And so it obviously struck a, a nerve and or cord. And um, I ended up um, finding out that the admissions officers at Brown and um, and uh, USC and various other schools were addicted to the blog in, in addition to a lot of um, college counselors. And um, it became... Uh, uh, for me, sort of a game of keeping it up, but trying to remain anonymous because I thought it would affect my son's chances of being admitted. And then one day I got an email from the head of admissions at Kenyon and she said she had tracked me down. She was a follower of the blog. She tracked me down just by asking someone, do you know the neurotic parent? And she ended up publishing 40 pages of my blog in her book, which was called um, Going to College, Not You. And I actually went on the road on a book tour with her. We had other fantastic authors in that book, like Anna Quinlan and Jane Hamilton. And I went on the road, but I I still didn't use my real name. I was still the neurotic parent. Then a year later, when my younger son was applying, and luckily he applied early and got accepted early, because otherwise I would have had a heart attack, a publisher did convince me to publish the book. And since then, I've sort of been a quasi-college expert. I've become friends with a lot of the admissions people and... Every year I have a new crop of neurotic parents that I and kids that um, I sort of help through the process. Wow, that's, that's really an incredible story, Judy. So what do you make of that? The fact that, you know, the blog and the book, you know, really struck a chord with folks. What do you, what do you think it is about the college admissions process? Well, what's happened now is that the colleges are – panicked because they want their rankings to be good. And so what they do is they recruit kids by sending, they market themselves to kids by sending brochures and catalogs and lookbooks, you know, sometimes like right after the kids take the P 
PSATs. And so the kids will get something from Harvard and say, wow, I can go to Harvard. But really, Harvard just wants them to apply so their rankings will go up. And what's crazy about that is U.S. News and World Reports, which is sort of a third or was a third rate news rep magazine that did the rankings, <laughs> was, was kind of in the dentist's office. And that's about that. They, you know, they're, they're very arbitrary and they base the rankings basically on nothing. Like, why should Georgetown be in the 20s when Wash U is number 10? It just doesn't make any sense. So parents have started to market and brand their kids at birth or even before birth to keep up with this game. And it's sort of a charade and, um, and the whole nation is in a panic because of that. Plenty of parents, you know, are stressed out about the process. Plenty of kids are stressed out. You know, there are lots of wacky experiences, but, you know, not everyone decides to go write a blog about this, right? So what was it about your experience or your take on this that led you to want to, to share that with others? Well, first of all, I had these soccer moms begging me to blog. You know, they said, oh, you're funny. You're a comedy writer. Just, you know, do it because we were going supposedly to too many schools. But also something happened on the first day of the tour where we were at Vanderbilt and a dad came up to me after the information session and he said, you're from the West Coast, right? And I said, yeah, how did you know? And he said, oh, your your son was yawning during the presentation. Like maybe you should sign up for an afternoon one. So here's some random guy was kind of calling me <laughs> out and I thought, oh, great. He's never going to get in there. And plus that we were traveling with another one of my son's best friends who had just gotten, they both had gotten their SATs back while we were on the tour, actually the first morning of the tour. And my son's friend who um, ended up going to Stanford had 200 points higher than my son. My son did fine too. He ended up at Duke, but at that point he still needed to get his SATs up. So the whole time I was thinking, Oh great. You know, here I am. It's like real estate, you know, showing a realtor, showing you houses that are millions of dollars, more than you can afford above your budget. And I thought that was going to be the case with my son. But I have to say my son, actually both sons were really not neurotic at all. They both had safeties that they loved. They did everything right. And they really weren't panicked. I was the one that panicked a little bit. When I'd never panicked before about any kind of other parenting thing. I mean, your, your, your sons were both successful. They ended up at, at great schools. And why, why were you stressing? I think I was stressing because of the hysteria in the air uh, from the other parents. And also there's a phenomenon, I think, that's kind of you're worried about separation and their childhood being over and you're not having control anymore. And it all kind of gets wrapped up in this um, this college admissions hysteria. It's like you're hysterical in general, so it's a nice excuse. Was there a particular pivotal moment or or turning point when you went from, you know, you know, blissful parenting, you know, they're still teenagers to suddenly, oh my God, my baby's leaving the nest. Absolutely. I mean, I remember um, my son said he was interested in Michigan as a school, which was actually a safety for him or turned it out, turned out being a safety for him. And wow. fantastic, fantastic school. And yeah, that's, a really- great, that's a great school to have as your safety. Right. <laughs> But I didn't realize at the time that it was. And I looked up on this website, College Confidential, which I call um, mm-hmm. in my book, The Scariest Place on the Internet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <It's> terrible. <laughs> and it had all these stories from kids that were applying to Michigan. And they would say, like, what are my chances? I've founded an orphanage and I've won a junior Nobel Prize and I've discovered a galaxy and I've my antibiotic is about to be patented and I don't think I'm going to get in. You know, I only have a 4.1 because I got a B once two years ago. And that I, I'm not really exaggerating that much. I mean, I, and I started thinking, wow, my kids are just normal kids. Um, you know, that son, the, the first son in particular was sports editor of his paper and he was captain of the soccer team and he worked with homeless kids in the summer, but you know, he definitely had not discovered a galaxy. Yeah, well, I mean, it still sounds like he did quite a bit, though. (laughs) (laughs) Well, those were sort of normal, good activities, but I thought they wouldn't be enough in the landscape. And also, there was a lot of hype that year that that it was 2009, that that was going to be the most difficult year in the history of the world to get into college. And that was the original name of my blog. Um, But actually, it turned out that 
2012, when my younger son applied, that was then deemed the most difficult year, even though there were fewer applicants that year. Wow. Wow. I mean, honestly, our listeners out there, you know, hear about College Confidential and the people talking about their 4.1s. I mean, honestly, I think a lot of folks are just making it up. I I think you're right. And if you look at the time that those kids post on College Confidential, it's always Saturday night when the more confident (laughs) kids kids are out there partying and, and they're stuck at home, you know, worrying about their GPA. I mean, the other issues in my book, I have something called why can't my genius kid child get in. And in addition to what I mentioned about the colleges marketing themselves, there's waiting, um, of GPAs, which did not exist at all when I was in high school. And so, net, you know, it used to be that you could get a, a 4.0 or a 100 or an A or whatever you want to call it. Now suddenly you can get a 5.8 because of APs. And yeah. so kids are taking 17 APs. And the school that my boys went to didn't offer APs. They offered honors classes. And we found out later that that was fine. That the colleges just want to see that you challenge yourself with whatever is offered. But I started thinking like, wow, they're up against these kids who've had 18 APs. And then there's also what I call amplification. With, you know, it used to be that you applied to three schools, a match, a safety, and um, or a reach, it was called a, a safety and a, a match. Yeah. And now kids are applying to, you know, 20 schools, 25 schools because of the common app. You know, it just takes one click. Also, kids are gaming the tests. You know, they are getting tutored. A lot of them start their SAT tutoring when they start high school in ninth grade. And um, and now the ACT has sort of surpassed the SAT. And it's, in a way, a little bit easier, a kinder, gentler test. You don't have to report all your scores. So a lot of kids are taking the real ACT as early as ninth or 10th grade and getting tutored up the wazoo. And I did in researching the book, find tutors that are charging $900 a session or even 1100 a session. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm out in New York and we definitely have a market for that kind of test prep hysteria. I mean, people have the money, they want the top scores, you know, just throw money at the problem, hope it gets solved that way. I mean, people, people will pay. Absolutely. And so I guess, and my kids were both very independent and they sort of wanted to do everything themselves. And my younger son actually lied to me about a score he got on a practice test because he didn't want me to get him a tutor. And Mm -hmm. so he said like, mom, I just took a practice test and I got a 35. So I'm cool. And then, you know, about a month later, I just, I found out that that wasn't true. Sure. Sure. No, I've even heard of kids, you know, in an SAT prep class together and they're taking practice tests and one kid will copy it off the bubble sheet of another kid when it's just a practice test in a prep class. Right. Like, why are you cheating on this? There are no I stakes. Know. You go home, show your parents, look, I got, you know, 2,300 on the practice test. I want to go out Saturday night, you know? Right. Well, I think that the testing, a lot of colleges are becoming really hip to that. And some of the really great schools now are becoming test optional. And I think that's one of, that's going to be the best news for the next generation. Um, oh, absolutely. So, yeah, you go on fairtest.org, you can look at a bunch of schools that, that don't require the SAT or the ACT, and they take a more right. holistic approach. Right. And it used to be like even NYU, when my first son was applying the the dean of admission said that every year he goes up to Columbia and he takes the test himself, the SAT, just because to to um, to kind of relate to the misery that the kids go through. But then the second time I saw him with my with my younger child, he they were saying, okay, now we're test optional, or you can we're not not we're SAT optional. You can send in results of any standardized test, including SAT twos or the subject tests. Oh, so it sounds like they're being a lot more flexible now. Correct. Well, it's, re- it's really nice to see that things are heading in that direction. Do you, I want to move into, you know, the worst college admissions moment you've ever seen or experienced. Now, take us to that moment in time. You must have so many stories. Just share with us one of those. Well, I get, it's incredible how many emails I get from my blog with really long stories. And I'd say the worst one was I, you know, when I do my public appearances, I always say, don't worry, your kid is going to get in somewhere. And every year I get emails from people saying like my 
son or daughter didn't get in anywhere. But really what they meant is they got into three or four great state schools, but none of the fabulous Ivies that they applied to. But there was one family that I spoke to that um, I actually ended up on the phone with them because I wanted to see whether it was true. And their daughter did not get in, literally did not get in anywhere. But she did end up working the wait list and she got into Bowdoin eventually. So it wasn't the end of the world. With my own kids, I'd say the bad story was the one I told you about traveling around with this kid who was on paper exactly like my son, but had a 200 point at that time higher score. It's not all about test scores. You know, there are things that maybe, you know, you're not, when you're not looking at the, at the numbers and you go a little bit deeper, there's all the soft factors. There's how you talk about yourself in the essay, right? That's right. And there's a lot of personality involved as well. And sometimes that can hopefully come across to the admission officers. Uh, another, I just, you just reminded me of another story I heard, um, which was from a kid who did not pull his applications to other schools when he applied early somewhere and he ended up getting into his dream school after he had already committed to early to another school and it was the parents contacted me and I said you know I this is a question for the ethicist of the New York Times like I'm not going to get involved like you know maybe if you email the first school they'll be cool about it but they ended up doing what they thought was the right thing and their son en- re- enrolled in the original school that he had committed to. Oh, that's great. I mean, there's there's so much stress around this, but you don't want to lose sight of, of who you are and what really matters. You know, you make a commitment, best to stick with that if you can. I want to move now to you know, a moment of inspiration that you've seen or experienced, you know, that light bulb moment that really sets you on the path to success. It's something that you could talk about that you've that you've experienced personally or with your own children. Well, I'd say in the college admissions process, I'm going to just say something practical, which is actually said a lot on College Confidential, and it's love thy safety. I think people spend so much time thinking about their dream school, and really what they need to do is think about a school they can realistically get into. As my son's college counselor in high school said, a school that if you wrote your essay on killing cats, you would still get in. And it's a school, <laughs> a school that they love, even even though um, it may not be the most prestigious school in the universe. And I think if you have a school like that, the whole process, like the way Michigan was for my older son, the whole process becomes a lot easier. Um, and nowadays, also, people are really worried about financial safeties. And there are a lot of really great private schools that give merit money. Um, so you don't have to count on your... Uh, state school or your public school anymore. But I would say, like, so when you're building a college list, build it from the ground up rather than from your dream school down. You just really hit on some super valuable insights. I'm, I'm so glad you brought those points. You're definitely getting my mind racing. You know, one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, like Sarah Lawrence College, you know, most expensive sticker tuition in the country, like $65,000 a year, all expenses included. But how many people are actually paying that? And for a lot of these other schools too, you know, there are discounts on the sticker price. And so you're not necessarily limited to the public schools if you actually do your research and hear some anecdotes from others. You know, a lot of this data isn't publicly available, but right. there are a lot of options out there that, you know, that I think folks, folks can keep in mind. Uh, another thing you're making me think about is, you know, I came across an applicant once, you know, the student I worked with, he told me that he would cut off his thumb if it meant he would get into Harvard because <laughs> it would please his parents. And uh-huh. thinking about that, I'm like, how much do you actually want to be there though? I mean, obviously you want to be there to satisfy other people and make them happy, but picture yourself there and think about what the next four years of your life would be like. Would you really be happy there? Right. Would that bring you to your goals? I mean, I think partly like 17 year olds, no matter how smart they are, they just have that missing frontal lobe. And so a lot of them, (laughs) a lot of them are, 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 um, wanting to please their parents. A lot of them are just listening blindly to peers. Like um, my kids, my older son would not refuse to apply to a really fantastic small liberal arts school that was really, you know, pretty much recruiting him to play soccer because 
he knew one kid who went there who he thought was a nerd who had, he said, everyone in the whole school has bad music on, in their <laughs> iPads. I mean, their iPods. And, um, and so, you know, so there, there's, there's peer pressure. There's the, the idea of, um, some kids look for the school that's going to have the fewest, the, the easiest essay or the, or no essay at all in addition to the common app essay. And a lot of them, like you said, are going to want to go to Harvard just because their parents want them to go there. And guess what? You know, I have this in my book uh, and also on the blog there, you know, you hear from these kids like after three or four months as freshmen saying like, wow, I got into Dartmouth, but no one told me how hard it was going to be. You know, why am I not at, at BU where it would have been a lot more reasonable for me where I wouldn't be killing myself every night? No, absolutely. You want to go somewhere where you're, where you're going to be happy. I mean, certainly you got to consider your professional goals if you have them in mind and what you want to study, what your passions are, what you're good at. But just right. to go to a school ranked, you know, number 10 over school ranked number 12, because number 10 is higher on the list. If number, if number 10 is in the middle of nowhere and number 12 is in a major city, that's what's going to make you happy in the end. Go to number 12. Or if you're a hipster and you want to go to a, a small liberal arts college with a bunch of other hipsters, don't go to Harvard. <laughs> exactly. You know, you're going to be with a totally right. different crowd. You know, So those are all things I, I think the students and parents really need to keep in mind. Because if you go to the wrong school and you set yourself on that path, you just committed to the next four years of what could be the, the biggest blast of your life. And at the same time, you know, help you develop towards, you know, towards your future, what you want to do afterwards as well. Uh, absolutely. I mean, every time I hear about these kids that get into all the Ivies, I think, wait a minute, how could anyone apply to Brown and Penn? They're complete polar opposites in terms of culture, in terms of, of um, student life, or, or Columbia, which is a, a core school, and Brown, which is where you make your own program, it, it just doesn't make sense that the same kind of person would want to apply to both of those. And so really, when you hear about someone applying to all the Ivies, they're just looking for prestige rather than something that's a good fit. No, absolutely. You know, some, some folks are just casting a wide net. Right. And Getting into all eight eyes is a fairly, fairly impressive accomplishment, but definitely you're going to have your preferences over what, what, sort of, what sort of fit is best for you. I want to move now into the lightning round. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions. You can give me some rapid fire responses. Are you ready? Okay. What's your number one piece of advice for the college admissions process? Well, I'd say um, take a deep breath and also what I said before, love thy safety. Absolutely. Uh, could you share with us one habit that you believe contributes to college admissions success? Listen to your mom or your dad or to grown ups. <laughs> little bias there, maybe, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Or to grown ups. <laughs> What's one online college admissions resource you absolutely love? Well, my blog, of course, um, the, the neuroticparent.com and my Facebook page, the neurotic parent. But I actually love, I, even though I said college confidential is really scary, I also love it because you can go on there and say, you know, quit, what's the best dance program? And you'll get an answer in two seconds. Absolutely. Valuable resource there. What's one book no college applicant should be without? Well, of course, mine, The Neurotic sure. Parents Guide to College Admissions, but also The Fisk Guide is absolutely a Bible. And leave it in the bathroom. Yeah, no, that's a super valuable resource. And we'll link to all of this in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, what are you currently working on or looking forward to? Well, I'm working on um, I'm, well, on two television shows now, which are for kids. And I'm um, that's been super time consuming and really fun, but I'm also looking forward to the neurotic parent movie. The book has op actually been optioned by some top Hollywood producers as a film. Oh, congratulations. That's really Thank exciting. You. Thank you. It still needs to get sold to a studio. So there's no announcement yet, but well, we'll keep an eye out for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, this, this was great studio. And where can folks, before you go, where can folks find you online? They can find me at jdrothman.com. That's my author's page or the neuroticparent.com. Okay, we'll, we'll link to all of those so folks can find you. Okay. Check out your blog and your wonderful book and all of those great resources. 
Thanks so much for joining us, Judy. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Back when I was applying to college, I had a mentor who helped me a ton with my college essays. He gave me some great advice that helped me make sure I was answering the key questions that admission officers are asking themselves. And with his help, I was able to significantly improve my rough drafts and submit an effective college essay in the end. It's one of the main reasons I ended up getting into Columbia. And in my conversations with admission officers since then, they've told me several of the key questions they're asking themselves as they read your college essays. I just want to share a couple of them with you now. One of the big ones they ask is, are you involved in your activities because you actually enjoy them? Or are you just doing them because you want to get into college? They're also asking if you've gone outside of your high school classes to learn and do research on your own. Another big thing they look to ask themselves is, have you demonstrated an ability to overcome difficult circumstances and distractions in order to succeed? They also want to know if you have the focus and the commitment and the drive to get through college because it's going to be tough sometimes. These are just a couple of them, but in my premium college essay course, we'll help you make sure you're answering all these questions and many other ones that college admission officers are asking themselves as they review your college essay. You can sign up to get access at collegeadmissionstoolbox.com slash essays. And before I sign off, I want to give you some advice from Anthony, a student I helped last year. He's now at UPenn, and he had some advice to share on answering the question about whether you're able to overcome those difficult challenges. He wrote to me, and I quote, Write about mentors and hard work situations. I spoke very honestly about being inexperienced as an intern at a startup and what I learned from it. It's key to be honest about your weaknesses. Nobody's weakness is that they are too diligent or that they're always on time. Everybody has weaknesses. More importantly, what have you done to work on overcoming your weaknesses? So I want you to look at your college essay drafts again. And have the people helping you review your essays ask themselves whether you're answering these questions and edit as you need to. Then email me your final draft at steve at collegeadmissionstoolbox.com. I'd love to see what you've written. Thanks for listening to College Admissions Toolbox. Head over to www.collegeadmissionstoolbox.com to get more free tools and resources that will help you get into the colleges of your dreams.